So let's just jump into Mark chapter 11. Uh, you know, it, it is a skill. You know, it's not it's not that easy to find a way to make everything awkward. And obviously, I have that talent, and uh, that's why I use my talent all the time to make things awkward. So we're going to look at Mark chapter 11, and uh, this is the story. So when they brought the colt to Jesus, they threw their cloaks over it. He sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything. But since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. So many of you, um, you have witnessed uh, one of Leah's superpowers. And that is she can go from happy to crying in 0.8 seconds, faster than Tesla, and then from crying to settle in 0.5 seconds. So fake. So fake. You know, so two-faced with her, and it's so shocking. That is more shocking than Jamie Oliver's Chili Jam. It was just like, wow, how did that happen? How, what, what is going on? And today's passage describes Jesus entering into Jerusalem, his final week on earth. And the crowd excited, they were just elated to see him. But the same crowd that chanted, Hosanna, Hosanna, on the Sunday, will be chanting, crucify him, crucify him, on the Friday. The most impressive two-face in the history. Why? You now, what happened for this to happen? In two weeks, as I said, will be Easter. And as we count down towards Easter, we will take a break from Philippians that have been going on for a few weeks now. And we will look at the events of the Holy Week, right? the week prior to Jesus' crucifixion. See, Jesus knew what this trip to Jerusalem meant. And Holy Week provides this clear window uh, into God's heart and intention and desire. And today we'll look at uh, Sunday and Monday, um, where Jesus entered into Jerusalem and he cleansed the temple. Next week we'll look at the events on Tuesday and Wednesday. And then on the 3rd of April, the, the special service I talked about, we'll be in Easter weekend and uh, we'll be experiencing the Easter experience together all right, at 4 30 p.m. We'll be living and listening through the events recorded in the Bible. Uh, we'll be going through just what, what was the Last Supper like? What happened during that time of the Last Supper uh, on Monday, Thursday? And uh, the, the story uh, of the Good Friday and the waiting of the Holy Saturday as well. And you are all invited uh, to join in the service on Easter Sunday uh, with the rest of our church together. All right, so Saturday, we're going to cover Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, and Holy Saturday. And on the Sunday, you can come to our church service in the morning and join in on Easter Sunday. Sounds good? Yeah. Sounds good. Uh, let us pray. Father God, I just thank you. I thank you as we gather together. There is a purpose, there is a meaning for you are with us. And I just pray as we look at the Holy Week events, we just see the purpose and the meaning that you are deliberately showing us through what you are doing. And I pray that you help us to capture who you are and what you're here to show us and how are we to respond to all that. Holy Spirit, be with us, anoint the words that I'm speaking so that it will go far deeper than word itself. Thank you, Lord. And pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So it says, as they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone uh, asks you, why are you doing this? Uh, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord needs it and will send it back here shortly. They went and found a colt outside the street, tied at the doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, What are you doing untying that colt? They answered as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. Alright, so, so, so this Sunday, you know, the day started with this seemingly insignificant incident. Yet it was recorded with this seemingly unnecessary detail. 
And actually, this incident appeared in all four of the Gospel books, which is not that common. Not many incidents appear in all four of the Gospel books. So the question is, why? You know, it's just, why did Jesus go and believe about this cult and how you do it, how you respond, and just that it happens accordingly? Well, obviously, there's something important and significant that we need to find out. And in fact, when we read it, we realize that Jesus was being very deliberate. He was deliberate in fulfilling uh, the prophecies about him. You know, Matthew and John both quoted from Zechariah 9, uh, verse 9. It says, it says that they quoted, Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. See, this is only one of over 300 prophecies that was made about the coming of uh, this figure, this Messiah in the Bible. And Jesus fulfilled every single one of them. And to help us understand that, Professor Peter Stoner in uh, 1958 gave a visual analogy to help us understand this. For an individual to fulfill eight of the 300 plus prophecies, um, let's just, uh, maybe maybe these eight, for example, you know, to fulfill the time of his birth that uh, recorded in Daniel 8 and 9, that he'll be born in Bethlehem, that is mentioned in Micah, born of a virgin, mentioned in Isaiah, uh, betrayed and sold for 30 pieces of silver in Zechariah, uh, he'll be mocked in Psalms, he'll be crucified in Psalms, he'll be pierced in Psalms as well, he will die with the wicked and he will be buried with the rich, uh, said in Isaiah as well. So eight prophecies that, that we come to know um, and, and see in Jesus' life. So Peter, uh, Professor Peter said, the probability of any individual meeting eight of these things, the probability would be one in 10 to the power of 17. Any idea what one to the power, 10 to the power of 17 is? It's a lot of zeros behind the one. Uh, so it's like one in... It's a lot, all right. It's, 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 it's a big number, or it's a small number. So imagine uh, we have uh, as many uh, this amount, as many of that ten cent New Zealand coins. Ten cent. To have that amount of money, it will fill the whole of Christchurch to the height of the eighth floor of our James Hyde building in Canterbury. And the probability of an individual fulfilling eight prophecies is as if one of these coins were painted bright blue and you are to find that coin in Christchurch that is filled up to eight four of James Height. All right, that's the probability of fulfilling eight prophecies. All right, so let's, let's add in eight more. 16 in total. We're now looking at one in 10 to the power of 45. I'm not going to put it on because PowerPoint can't fit in. Um, anyone remember your solar systems? Who are not very confident. It's like, are you going to ask a following question? It depends. Uh, if we take these coins, all right, 10 to the power of 45, and we fold a ball, and we place that bright blue coin right at the center of that ball, the size of the ball will literally be the the sphere of that ball will be the size of uh, this orbital of Neptune. What does that mean? So the bright blue coin will be the center, will be, will be the sun. And the size of it will be how big Neptune will orbit around the sun. All right, we're not talking about planet, we're talking about orbit, a sphere. So that's how big this coin ball would be. And the probability of someone fulfilling 16 of the prophecies is like finding that coin in that. All right, let, I, I, feel, I feel like we're, we're, we're really excited. But how about eight more, right? Do I hear, do I hear 24? 24? 24. 24, 24, 24, great. So now that, sorry Justin, too late, too late. 24 goes to, goes to Eli. So now we're looking at one in 10 to the power of 150. Seven. Right, 10 cents coins are now too big for this analogy. We we'll need to use the smallest particle known to mankind, that is the electron. And imagine if we could pack electrons side by side. If you have any PTSD from chemistry or physics, I'm very sorry. But imagine if we can pack 
10 to the power of 157 electrons tied in together and to form a, a special electron ball, this ball would be bigger than our known universe. 24 prophecies. And these 300 prophecies, they were made, the last of it were made 400 years before Jesus came into sin. So it wasn't that Jesus came up and then people start writing up things to fit his description. No, it was made prior, 400 years or more before Jesus. And Jesus met every single 300 plus of the prophecies. And in fact, a lot of these prophecies are not just a religious, spiritual backing from the Bible. There's historical evidence of how it fits the historical Jesus uh, historians come to know. See, Jesus was deliberate in reminding everyone, I am the prophesied one. I am the prophesied one. When they, when they brought the coat to Jesus and threw their coats over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their coats on the road while others spread branches they had cut in the field. So I mentioned about the 400 years uh, before Jesus. So the, the last uh, prophet, Malachi, to Jesus 400 years. So for 400 years in between, uh, God actually had been silent in Israel's history. So what happened before Malachi for thousands of years, uh, God spoke to prophets, God spoke to different people, and that's how Israel's history continued. But for 400 years since Malachi, uh, God didn't speak to, through anyone. And so for 400 years, Israel had been living under uh, other uh, great kingdoms as well. And then for 400 years, they've actually been waiting for a king. Uh, the Messiah that these 300 or so prophecies were talking about, they're waiting for that Messiah who will free them from their captivity and make Israel a great kingdom again. And actually through that 400 years, a few Figures, Jewish figure came into scene. They did something that people wanted. Could it be? Could this be the Messiah? Could that be the Messiah? But most of them died and they were crucified later on also by Romans. That's how Romans uh, punished their um, criminals. And But what? One seemed to have been successful. Judah Maccabee. And Judah Maccabee led uh, some red rebels against the Seleucid armies in that time. And on 25th of December, 164 BC, on that day, Judah Maccabee, he rode into Jerusalem on his horse. And he came in and he was shouting, Hosanna, which means God save us. And people were chanting with him. And people cut off palm branches and waved at him to welcome him in. Because palm branches were symbolic to the Jews as a sign of rejoicing. It was also symbolic to the Greek as a sign of victory. And it was symbolic to the Romans as a sign of royalty. And the first thing he did entering Jerusalem was he went to the temple and he cleansed the temple. He removed the temple of these idols and other Roman gods and he restored it to how Jesus would use it to worship uh, not how Jews, how Jews would use it to worship God. So that's kind of the background of, of what's happening when Jesus entered. And then the laying of the cards, well, it's simply an act of honoring. All right, so back in that time, the ground is always dusty because it's open, it's not sealed. So imagine when you go out for a hike and you sometimes go off off-road. And when you go off-road, as you drive up, dust will always go up and your car will get very dirty. So it's kind of like that. So, so to lay down the cross for someone to walk on is a very practical way of honoring that person. So that as they walk and as the, as the horse comes in, the dust would not fly up and wouldn't get them dirty. So it's a very practical way of honoring. So we see the same way. Jesus was welcomed into Jerusalem as a king and he was praised as a savior. It says that those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna, blessed! is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. So the word Hosanna in Hebrew means save now. Right? It's a very urgent plea to the one who saves. 
And it's also used to recognize the one who can save right now. And when they chant this, this is uh, very powerful from the crowd because uh, just one day before the entrance, uh, John recorded this happening. So there was a large crowd, um, and they found out where Jesus was. They came to Jesus because Jesus had just raised Lazarus from the dead. So it was just like, wow, how did this happen? So there were crowds gathering. And then it was the next day, um, the next day, the great crowd um, that had come for the festival. So it's talking about after witnessing Lazarus' uh, resurrection or being raised from the dead, they then go to Jerusalem as well to join this big festival uh, with palm branches. And then they were shouting together. So, so when they chant, when they shout, Hosanna, it is very fitting because they had just seen, heard, and known that Jesus had raised a man from the dead. All right, and, and actually, historically uh, speaking, they believe that it was actually a chant. I don't know whether you guys ever been to like sports events. Uh, I've never been, I just watch it online. But like, in the NBA, sometimes they'll play like the music and people like, be like clapping, react. Like, Defense. And you know that, that, that's chanting. Alright, so this is actually similar but without the clapping in that way. I don't know. I actually don't know. But what they will do is um, there, there will be a one that is a, a head, alright? One that's a head and one follows. So the one ahead will say something. Hosanna! And then the crowd will join in and say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And then the one in the head will say, this is the coming kingdom of our father David. And everyone else will be like, I was in the highest heaven. And then they'll repeat. So imagine that thing walking in, people chanting, people shouting. It was, it was that kind of. Oh, I just stepped on this as well. That's right. You, you just have to work with my voice. I'll step forward a bit. Anyway, I got very excited from this. So, so it, was, it was really a scene, right? And um, should, I, should we try? So it's like, nah, 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 nah. it'll be a flop, it'll be a flop. <laughs> We're not this type of people. <laughs> anyway, but all this parade, all this hoorah, feels extremely uncharacteristic of Jesus. So far in his life, that's not how Jesus did things. But he allowed it because he was deliberate in allowing it because he knew who he is and he is to become. Right? This feels very scary. It feels like we're breaking it. As Jesus entered into Jerusalem, he went and. Um, yeah, so this. Oh, so this. Oh, where am I? Oh, no, no, yeah, that's why it's coming up. Oh, we have to start again. Oh, no, we don't. Let me see where I am. Alright, and then, and then. So Jesus entered into Jerusalem and he went into the temple's court. He looked around at everything. It was already late, so he went back with the 12 uh, to Bethany. So, so that's kind of a wrap for day one. All right, Sunday of the Holy Week. So, uh, pretty good, pretty good so far. You know, things are pretty happy, chappy. And uh, so, Jesus is very deliberate in conveying who he is and how people should respond to him. All right, Jesus is very deliberate in conveying who he is and how people should respond to him. That he is the prophesied Messiah, he is the one who came to save, and that in his presence, people should. Rejoice, and that he is he was he is to become victorious in what some fashion. He is of royal status, the king of all kings, and he is worthy of our honor and praise. See, Jesus was deliberate because he knew who he is, and he was worthy and fitting of all that they were doing. But at the same time, Jesus really, really knew who he is, that he would ride. In a low, uh, in, on a lowly donkey instead of being on a horse. So he's conveying something uh, very deliberately to the crowd. So then the next day, next day come. On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple courts and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of uh, the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. And he would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said, Is it not written, My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. So, so why are these money changing, all these things happening in the temple in the first place? 
See, Passover is one of the biggest celebration in Jewish uh, Jewish traditions, and with it, there are specific instructions about the sacrifice and offering each family uh, was to make. And when we talk about sacrifice and offering, the most important element is the sacrifice. Alright, so when, when God gave Israel uh, this, these law, He instructed them to bring a sacrifice that is without blemish or defect. So the Bible used those words, blemish or defect. It is saying that this needs to be perfect. No diseases, no illness, no scratches here and the bruises there, no broken bone here or something like that. So it says it has to be without blemish or defect. And the reason for that is very simple, because the goal of the sacrifice is to remove us of the sin because God is a holy God. Alright? So the one that is to take our sin has to be as holy as possible. That is why they say without blemish or defects. And, uh, and, and then because the requirement of it, it comes at a cost. Uh, it's hard to find something that is that precious. And the cost is to remind us the weight of sin and that God is a holy God. And it's trying to reinforce that. So that, that's kind of the, the idea behind it. Very simple and straightforward. So, so they have to bring this without blemish and defect sacrifice. So many Jews at that time, they would actually travel to Jerusalem. And it is likely that you bring your sacrifice with you. You know, where you're from, you found the sacrifice. Ah, this is very, very good. Let's bring them along. But along the way, because the journey is actually very difficult, uh, it's actually quite difficult. There's, there's chances that the sacrifice, a little lamb or bull or whatever, might injure themselves. Right? They, might, they might trip, they might fall, they might hurt, they might scratch their cart and it's not no longer pretty. They have bumps and bruises. And this is a, this is a real thing. So, so people uh, actually start preparing and selling sacrifices at Jerusalem as you approach the temple. Kind of like a last minute purchase before you do this uh, do the sacrifice. And so over time, many Jews actually opt to not even bring a sacrifice because you can just buy one at Jerusalem, which kind of makes sense. And then there's the currency thing. You, can't, you can only use temple currency in the temple. So you have, to, uh, so you have money changers to take people's uh, Roman dollars and exchange it to temple uh, currencies uh, when they do uh, buying and selling things in the, inside the temple. So that's kind of the big backstory about you know what's happening in the temple, and you know the, the reason for what was going on that happened in the temple it, it seemed it seemed reasonable, yeah? it, it seemed reasonable. But Jesus was so furious when he saw it that we said that he overturned the table. Uh, probably not the same way we see memes when people overturn the table and they lose katan, but could be similar. Could be similar. He was angry. Uh, and then he stopped people from going through the courts with their merchandise. And he said two things. Is it not written, my house will be called the house of prayer for all nations? He quotes from Isaiah 56. But you have made it a den of robbers, quoting from Jeremiah 7, 11. So two things happened. Jesus overturned the table and he prevented people from going through. Two statements were made, one from Isaiah and the other from Jeremiah. And Jesus was actually deliberately addressing two issues. Two issues. See, instead of coming to the temple and treating it as a place of prayer, what, you will, what will happen when you enter in the temple at that time? It's like a market. It's like a market-like environment. The animals are making sound, the sheep goes by, the cow goes moo, there's no fox over there, but there's that the smell, the droppings that's happening. There's a lot going on. You see, you have the buyers checking their merchandise, they're sacrificing, like, haggling the price. Come on, man, it's not the going price outside of Jerusalem. What are you doing here? Come on, do me a solid. I bought, I bought one last year. You know, a whole family, like a family of 20 buys from you. You know, it's just this haggling going on. And there's some people with their own sacrifice, you know, it's like, oh, now, now this is messy. Stuff and they're hoping for a trade and be like, hey, this is still pretty good, it's still pretty good, you know, let's uh, do me a deal here. A lot was going on, and there's the merchants driving up the prices, you know, haggling the customers. So there's a lot of noises going on in the place. So people come in to the place of prayer, yet their mind is first occupied by mammon or money. Their mind is first occupied by money. 
Jesus said in Matthew 6, No one can serve two masters. Either you hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Jesus was angry because at the most important festival that celebrates the God who saved them from Israel, they, they come in caring about money first. And today, we do the same thing. Today, we do the same thing. We are quick to put God second place to our career, to our side hustles, to our financial independence. We're more focused on building our trust in money than to trust God with our money and trust His provision for us. You know, it's so easy for us, just like the Jews at that time, thinking I'm here to worship God, yet mixing it up so it looks like I'm worshiping God, but it's really not, because what God desires is something completely different. But yet, for them to feel good about themselves, they mix it together and say, no, we just have to. We have to do it this way. There's no other way other than mixing God with our money. When God says, no, that's not how I desire from you. But then perhaps the bigger issue is the other one. Jesus will not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said, Is it not written, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations? See, the courts that they're talking about is the outer region. Uh, these are the courts, outer region, and this is the biggest part. Um, and this court, uh, Jesus was referring to, where the activities were happening, this is the court of Gentiles. This is the only place in the temple that non-Jewish people were allowed to come and worship at. They can't go into the temple. You see, God specifically called the Israelites, called the Jews, and says, you are my people. You are meant to be a light in all nations, and that you are going to be so strong as a kingdom that all nations will be like, whoa, what's going on in Israel? Who is that God? So that they will come and worship me together. So that's Israel's mandate. That's their purpose. God says, shine, be a light in all nations. And yet, with that mandate, they're now stopping and preventing non-Jewish people from worshiping in this time. So it's a direct contradiction to what God expects of them and have commanded them to do. And this is why Jesus called, you have made it a den of robbers. And Jesus was especially angry because these Jewish leaders had robbed the Gentiles of the opportunity to praise and worship God so that they can gain a profit and wealth for themselves. You see how, how it is? They have robbed the Gentiles an opportunity to praise and worship God for the gain of their own profit and wealth. And Jesus was furious. And so Jesus was deliberate in his cleansing of the temple because his anger reflects God's anger. When the poor is being exploited by the wealthy, God's heart moves with them. When people are being robbed of the presence of God, God's heart becomes angry. Because that's not how it's supposed to be. So Jesus was deliberate to remind and establish that the temple of God, that, to remind them that the temple of God um, is holy. Jesus is deliberate to remind them that the temple of God is holy. And in fact, the temple of God, later on, uh, as Jesus, after Jesus died, uh, the idea, the image of the temple of God is not the physical temple, it is us. In fact, it, it, it is the body of Christ that we are the temple of God. So Jesus is deliberate because he wants to establish and remind us the temple of God is holy. We are God's holy people. And the temple of God is a place of prayer for all nations and all people. He was deliberate to make the temple holy because it is the dwelling place of a holy God. And he's reminding us today of the same thing. But this was not what the leaders nor the people expect from him. And that's how everything started um, to shift. The chief priest and, the chief priest and teacher? Hmm, wonder if I... I don't think this is okay. Um, and the chief priests and teachers of the law heard this and began looking for a way to kill him. 
for they feared him, because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. All right, so the leaders, they were angered because Jesus interfered with their income. Jesus threatened their profit. They were angered because Jesus challenged their way of doing things. All right? He threatened their power. They were angered because Jesus had people praising him, which threatened their popularity. All right? their, their profit, their power, their popularity, Jesus is uh, going against that. And that's the ironic thing, isn't it? When Jesus is not what we expected him to be, what we wanted him to be, we want to make him God and money, but Jesus said, hey, I'm just God, like, take the money out of it. And when, we're not, when he's not what we expected him to be, our attitude towards him can change so drastically that instead of learning, learning about who this God is, what's the desire for, why is he doing this thing this way, we first preserve and guard our desire and our comfort and say, hey, this is not all bad. Why can't I do it this way, the way I want it? Why do I do it that way, the way Jesus is presenting? So from Sunday to Monday, we see things already changing. Already changing. And I just want to look at uh, just a little thing um, in both days. Uh, that is just a small thing, but it ties up pretty nicely. And um, so, so Jesus, as he approached Jerusalem, says that he saw the he saw the city and he went for it. I'm looking for oh, Tom's here, sorry. <laughs> I was just like, where's Tom? Where's Tom? <laughs> so as Jesus approached Jerusalem, he saw the city and he went over it. So the triumphant entrance on Sunday actually opened uh, with a sad note. So before uh, Jesus even entered it, he went over the city. And then what else? Because Jesus knew that these people, what they were like, that, that, that they were putting up a front, that they're still trying to keep things the way they like it, that they don't really want to seek God and honor His desire. They don't want to worship the God who is. They want to worship their own version of God. So Jesus, as He approached, He knew that's what's happening. So He went. He went because of the condition of the disobedient. He went because the destination of the disobedient is destruction. And Jesus wept. And as Jesus heads towards Jerusalem, the next day on Monday, the next day as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. Seeing in a distance a fig tree and leaf, he went to find out if it had any fruit. And when he reached it, he found nothing but leaves. Because it was not the season for figs. Then he said to the tree, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And the disciples heard him say it. Other parts of the Bible said, you know, immediately or two, three days later, the, the tree just withered and died. To understand what happened uh, is happening here, we need to first park our judgment on Jesus for cursing this poor fig tree when it's clearly not in seasons for fig, right? I know we all think about it when we're just like, but it's not a season. What are you cursing? It's so mean, you know? Let's park that aside because obviously he is deliberate in making a point here. Come on, Jesus knows fix tree better than we do. The second thing is, you know, you've got to put on our gum boots and sun hat and learn about gardening, especially about fig tree, which I don't have a gum boot, do I have a sun hat because I don't know gardening? Luckily, uh, Google does. So fig trees are, are common in the area Jesus grew up in. And it's a tree um, that, that actually bears fruit multiple times um, a year. So you can say it has many seasons for fig each year. And in fact, some fig trees can be fruitful 10 of the 12 months. This is like the fruit you get, guys. If, if you're into fruit and if you're into these things, this is the biggest bang for your buck kind of fruit. And, uh, it's like, give it to your mom and dad, you know, they would be like, whoa, so smart. This completely reflects our Chinese culture and tradition. Biggest bang for buck. Anyway, why, why, why was Jesus angry? Um, it's not because, um, it's not because they're often fruitful or things, and this time it's not uh, that got the angry Jesus, you know, angry and cursed it. Fig trees actually uh, start bearing fruits first, alright? So they're the type of fruit that you just see sticks. The fruit 
will come out, and then the leaf will come out. So a leafy fig tree is an indication that there is fruit. And also, the fruit can also be green, which makes it hard to know if there are fruits under the leaf as well. So why was Jesus in green? Well, in our, in our 21st century layman term, he was trolled by the fruit. Alright, he was completely the tree pretended to be fruitful by its leaf, but at closer examination, it had no fruit. The fig was an empty promise. It was a hypocrite. It was faking on the outside, but has nothing to show for it. It was much like Jerusalem and the Jewish people that Jesus would encounter, and they're all about worshiping a god they want. They're not about. Following who this God called them to be. And this is the imagery Jesus was deliberately, the Bible authors was deliberately presenting to us to remind us the severity of what Jesus is showing us. A fig with leaf but no fruit is a hypocrite. What about us? You see, there is a God we want. And there is a God who is. They're not the same God. The turning point of our lives is when we stop seeking the God we want and start seeking the God who is. There is a God that we want to mix with money, mix with our selfish ambitions, mix with our own selfish needs in many different ways. And there is a God who is. And often. We don't realize they're different because we have created our own God without realizing it. But the reality is, they are not the same God. And there's a point in our lives that we have to come face to face with the reality: Am I Jerusalem? Am I like that fig tree? Am I like the people in the temple? Or will I turn? And will I turn around and start seeking the God who is? See, who is Jesus? Jesus is the King, and He was welcomed as one. Jesus is the Savior, and He was praised as one. Jesus is a prophet, and He went over Jerusalem like a prophet would. He is the Son of God, and He has the authority to cleanse His Father's house. And He's also a friend of sinner, that He would He would reserve the court for those who come to worship. See, so the question for us today, as we look at the first two days of the Holy Week. Are we serving? Are we serving the God who is, or are we serving the God we want? We have to ask ourselves: Who are we praising? Are we praising the God that we want to see and do the things we want to see Him do, or are we praising the God that He will do what He will do? Who are we serving? Who are we praising? Who are we? Are we like the fig tree? With the leaves, with everything that looks like a follower of Jesus, but in our life there is no fruit. That in our life we can't stand firm on the word of God that bears love, that bears peace, that bears joy, that bears you know goodness, kindness, faithfulness, self-control, and all these kind of things. What are we like? This is who God is. Worshiping the God who was, or are we just worshiping the God we want? See, God is a holy God, and a holy God means that He is about one thing. That's kind of what holy is. You know, He's about for God, He is about Himself because He is everything. For us, what God desires for us is that we become holy. We become about that. As well. To be holy is to be wholeheartedly, to do your best with your heart's desire to aim for that one thing. It's not saying that we'll never, we will we'll always achieve it and never make mistakes. But it is the desire that God wants to see us to be holy, to be willing to be corrected, to be willing to say I will repent, to be willing to say I realize that this is not God, but I need to come back to God. And God is a holy God, and that.
that's what He desires for us, holiness. And in fact, God is also wholeheartedly for you first. Before you have done anything, Jesus had already come with you in mind that He has given up His life for you as well. He's given His peace for you. He's given His life for you. And the thing, you know, one thing I really believe about, you know, when Jesus was angry, I think part of Him was, was really sad. See, he has this life. When the Bible says Jesus came to give us life and life abundant, he has this life that he wants to give us. He has this life he wants us to experience. He has this life he wants us to taste and then having that life come out of our lives by bearing the right fruit. He has this life for us to live a fruitful life. And yet we don't realize just how precious that is. We don't realize. And I think that's that's kind of the, the is that we think we know what is best. And God is just pulling us here, just like, come on, there's nothing better than this. I've given everything so you come to receive this and understand just how good life can be with me. And we're exchanging it for something else. See, tonight I feel like God is calling us back. Coming back to, to Him, who He is. Coming back to a life that the right fruit, coming back to standing firm on what God is teaching us and who God is, because He is not a little bit pleased at all with our superficial performances. Rather, empty praises, saying the right words, quoting from the Bible, he, He's not about that. He wants our heart, whole heart for Him. I wonder if today you're willing to just come back again. Are you willing to assist? Who is the God you're serving? Are you willing to look into your frustration about, 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 about your spirituality, about your life, and to realize perhaps, perhaps you are wanting a God who is not who He is. Perhaps you're wanting the God you want, and you're frustrated because it's not who God is. And spiritually, you know there's a
wants me to just end with a with a heavier note today, actually, not to really bring it back up in any way, because you need to understand just the weight and severity of disobedience. It is not a joking matter. There are seasons in our life that we may feel stuck for a bit, but it can only be a season. Jesus was deliberate to show us who He is, to remind us that He is worthy of 